friends. Hi, it's Jen or Jenny. That's what you may call me. Um, a video. It's only been three years, but it feels like. Hello, friends. Hi, it's Jen or Jenny. That's what you may call me. Um, so if you don't know who I am, let's go on the Got a lot of people messaging me after that, and uh, I made a few friends from it, and I was happy to help a few young people who were aspiring to get into the animation industry, so I'm really glad that I made that video, I'm really glad I got to meet some of you, and so a lot has happened since that video. It's only been three years, but it feels like I've lived several lifetimes, honestly. Um, so keep watching, and I will tell you everything that happened. <laughs> So when I made that first video, um, I was at a small studio <coughs> in St. Catharines. It was my first job. I got hired at the Industry Day at Sheridan, um, which is when a lot of studios come and they watch your final film, your thesis project, and some of them even submit offers if they want to hire you, which is great, especially if, um, you know, you want to work at a studio and you want to work in the animation industry and you know hopefully you move your way up etc mm. so it's great mm. and you don't have to like kind of go out on your own and cold call studios it's it's a really mm. important day um for a lot of mm. new grads so i was really lucky mm. to have gotten an offer from this studio um so mm. i feel like i need a bit of a disclaimer because i kind of in that video, I was like really, really happy to have my first job. And you have to understand, I was coming from like making nothing to like all of a sudden having a regular income. And that was really life changing for me. Um, but of course, you know, when you're just starting out, comparatively, you don't actually make that much money. So looking back at it now, I really wasn't making very much, even though I was like, really really proud at the time so it's like it's about perspective right um so and I, I don't i don't mean to say this in the way that like you should expect like to make six figures right up the gate starting way kind of have to work your way up that's just how it is right so i was really happy i don't fault myself for that but um in the years following that, it was really, really difficult for me to kind of um, save up any kind of money because it was so low, like the pay was so low that I was sort of living paycheck to paycheck. And yes, like, I, it was great, you know, because I was coming from zero, so anything is better than zero, right? But at the same time, like, I had a lot of student debt from Sheridan, um, had about like, 40k, a little, little bit less than 40k in debt, and, you know, I had credit card bills, living expenses, stuff like that, so it's starting to pile up, and, and I was working a lot, it wasn't exactly, like, really exciting work, it, it was kind of just, like, the bare minimum, what they would give you since you don't have that much experience, like, there's no way you're going to become a lead character designer right when you graduate, mm. so I... You know, I was doing, um, I was doing concept and St. Catharines and I was living in Oakville. 
though. I don't know how to explain that to you if you don't live in Ontario, but it's far and I had to carpool with somebody every day and I ended up only going in part of the week when I got paid. Hard to get into that program that I didn't really think about it too hard. So, fast forward, um, well, I think it was the Lots of studios in Vancouver, so well. <laughs> um, it was <laughs> it was very tough. <laughs> Just... 
them. I tried to bum it up a couple. Uh, I, I, I could make another video about the buttons. The animation. But anyways, I digress. So I went there. Um, I was doing layout. I wasn't a concept artist, but at this point, I just didn't give a shit. <laughs> I was like, I'll do it. So it was for um, a pretty cute project. Um, I don't think it ever aired. It was for a pilot, but anyways, it was like my first time doing layout, so I didn't really know like all the technical stuff. It, I just knew how to draw like things in perspective and you know basic stuff like that, um, like the drawing stuff. But there was a lot of technical stuff uh, with layout that I didn't know. Like, uh, how do I explain this? Like layering things and file naming things. Um, yeah, there was just a lot of things that had very little to do with drawing. So if you're thinking about getting into layout, just be warned. It's it's a very technical job. You're not designing backgrounds. Um, most of the time, you're actually just taking elements from a key background illustration and redrawing them, resizing them, making sure they're in perspective, etc. You you basically don't draw. <laughs> so, but it's a job. It's a job in the animation industry and yeah, that's pretty much that was my criteria at the time. Um so, you know, the the team was very small. It was very small. I think it was one, two, three, five people including myself. Um, and it was one of many projects the studio was working on, so it wasn't a very big one, we didn't have a very big staff or a very big budget, but luckily my lead was a lot of people, I was like a dumbass, and I talked to the game in the interview, but I really didn't know anything about layout. Um, so I think she kind of knew, even though, it's like she still hired me, I think they just really needed somebody, so, you know. <laughs> Again, I was like living through such a Basically, all my money went to the um, and I pretty much didn't spend any money on myself. So, yeah, it wasn't fun, but it just got me out of the house and it wasn't like, you know, I was thinking that I just got to the park and no one would have fired me. Eventually, um, all right, I got a girl from one of my teammates who had been in the industry a very long time, so she was a very strong referral, to another studio, which I feel like I can't name because I'm about to, like, I'm about to say some shit about it. So I'm not going to say what studio it was, but um, it was a big studio, and it was the biggest one to date that had offered me a job, and they didn't interview me because I had come on such a strong referral from my friend who I'd met at Rainmaker. She was really well known by them. I think she'd worked with them before. So they were just like, oh yeah, it's coming from her. Then just hire this girl. She doesn't need an interview. And I was like, oh, that's good. Um, but the if they had interviewed the me, they would have known that I had just started doing layout and I didn't really have that much experience. Oh, what the fuck? I wasn't a pro. I could draw well. But in terms of the technical requirements for layout, I was still pretty much a noob. So I had like a bit of a break in between the gigs. So we went to Disneyland. It was a good time. Um, John paid for everything because I was really, really uh, poor. Fuck. But I, I was okay because, you know, I really had a job waiting for me. <sighs> so, started this job. It's a really, really big project. Um, Big team, really well known animation. Probably most of you have seen it. It's an. No, I don't want to say too much. <laughs> yeah, anyways, people who know me know what it was. So, uh, I was really like proud that I got hired to work on this. A lot of people um, accepted really low rates because it was such a well known show and it would help your career. Fuck yo. So, you know, we were all really excited to be there. Um, and then everything went to Whoa. Uh, 
living in a basement <clears throat> and I was really cold and I got sick a lot. So <clears throat> I got sick with something. I don't even know what it was this day. It was like the flu. Even though that year I got my flu shot and I don't usually get the flu shot because I'm like, oh, I'm healthy, I'll be fine. But this year I did. And that is the year that I got the flu, ironically, right? Dumb. Anyways, I got the flu and it was really bad. Like, I don't get sick very often. But this one was a doozy, okay? It was like, COVID wasn't around yet, but Man, I feel like it would have been similar to what COVID was. It was freaking awful. Okay, I had chills and it just wouldn't go away. It was like two weeks of just feeling miserable, like bedridden, fever. And uh, I lost my voice. I couldn't talk. It was awful. And I, I took so many meds just to manage the symptoms. And it was really, really difficult on my body. I actually went into work because I was... <laughs> People would think I was skipping intentionally because I was away for I think two weeks but I came in and I was like really sick and like people could tell obviously because I lost my voice and I could barely speak when I finally got over it and I came back um, something in my lead changed his demeanor towards me changed he started being kind of like suspicious of me in really strange ways. <laughs> like, and that I was trying to get out of doing work. Don't know why. <laughs> um, but, he, yeah, so it started like a trend where he would, he would pass behind my desk and he would like, I could feel him looking at me and like, judging what I was doing on my computer. So I started to get like really paranoid. <laughs> and um, eventually he took me into a room. <sighs> God, this is awful reliving this. It's like really traumatic for me. Um, I still have nightmares about this to this day, but <laughs> a bunch of other people who I had never spoken to before. And he pulled out a notebook. Okay, a notebook full of things that he didn't like about me or things that he had noticed that I was doing mm. that he didn't like. And he started reading off this notebook in front of these people. There was like HR, there was like someone from animation who I don't ever talk to. They're like not even the same department. And it was humiliating. Okay, it was truly, truly awful. Um... To be honest, I've kind of blocked out some of it, so I can't really give you details because it was just that awful. Um, but after mm. that day, I started having panic attacks. I've never had panic attacks in my life. I had to Google what it was because I was just like, I had come back from lunch and I was about to go back up to the studio and I was just standing in an alleyway outside the building, just like hyperventilating and like there were like spots in my vision and things started like kind of glowing and I was just like, what the fuck is happening? And like, I was like, I really don't want to go back in right now because I'm really scared. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry, give me a minute. So anyway, so the things that he addressed were, um, there were small things. There were small things, but for some reason, like, you know, when you're looking for something in somebody to prove a theory that you have, you find things. Right? So I kind of think that's what it was. Like, um, maybe I had forgotten to turn on a layer. It's very easy to just turn it back on, right? If you're an art lead and you're just, like, looking over stuff, you just turn it back on and you submit it. End of story, right? But he, he would make this a point that I was, like, not paying attention or I was lazy. Um, or... <laughs> I, I had been going back and forth with him on this rough, which was ridiculous because you know now that I have more experience and I can look back he was incredibly nitpicky like like it was actually a waste of his time to be that nitpicky with me but he would go over and over this rough with me and I, I was like okay that's fine he, he really wants to like make sure that it's right um so you know he was so nitpicky that I felt like I had to ask him for everything because 
like he would always find something that I did. So when this thing finally got approved and I cleaned it up and I submitted it, um, he called me over to his desk and he asked me if I deleted the rough sketch, even though he had already approved it and I had already cleaned it. And I was like, um, yeah, I deleted the rough just because I was trying to clean up. You know, these, these backgrounds, they were really, really detailed and they had a lot of layers. So I just deleted things that I didn't need anymore. So I deleted the rough. That's, that's usually what I do. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Let me tell you, I don't do that anymore. But I deleted the rough and I didn't think it was a big deal because he'd already approved it. And he was so angry at me. He was shaking. I'm not even exaggerating. He was shaking. His voice was raised. I literally thought like, what the f This guy was like livid, okay, that I had deleted a rough drawing that he'd approved. Now, if you don't have any experience in the industry, this is not normal. This guy had serious anger management problems. And that was just like one instance, okay? Um, after that, uh, I was really, really scared for, like, I think a couple weeks. Um, I just, I, I was the last one to leave. I didn't want to leave before anyone else. Um, I had been trying to take kickboxing classes so that I could lose some of the weight that I'd gained from my depression episode, but I missed all of those because I was so afraid of this guy um judging me so i was the last to leave and the first one to arrive i had post-it notes all over my desk of notes from people who gave me advice so that i could improve i asked my co-workers at lunch i was like dead set on improving and being perfect and in the end they still fired me yep they brought me into a room one day. This HR person came over to my desk. Hey, Jen, could you come with me? I went into a room. There was this animation guy, not part of my department again, but he gave me, like, this really condescending speech about, like, you know, I think you need to think about what you really want. Do you really want this? And, you know, I actually laughed. <laughs> in the meeting because it was just so absurd because I had gone through so much shit. Like, like I couldn't even take a break without this animation guy. I don't know. You know, I think you need to think about what you really want. Do you really want this? And you know, I actually laughed in the meeting because it was just so absurd because I had gone through so much shit. Like, yeah, sure. Like, like I couldn't even take a break without this animation guy. I don't know who he was, but I guess my lead had talked a lot of stuff about me to him, so he already like judged me without knowing me. But even when I was just taking like a break, like a breather, because I was so freaking stressed in the lunchroom, he would he would see me and he would be like, "Hey, Jen," like in a really <laughs> like. I see you. I see what you're doing. You should be working. And I was just like, what the heck? So he was the one who was there when they fired me. Not even my lead. My lead wasn't even there. Nope. <laughs> so they were like, yeah, so we are, um, we are terminating your contract. And, you know, it was like, I don't remember what they said. I was just like all the blur. I just kind of like blacked out. But I collected my stuff and, um, yeah, I left. They escorted me out. It was humiliating and it just so happens that was the day before uh john and i were going to move out of that basement to a, a condo that was closer to my work uh, so that my commute wouldn't be as long the irony right <laughs> ah, okay ah it's been a while since i told that story um it was a very important learning experience for me because it taught me what i didn't want um, you know, even though that animation guy was a dick, um, and he was really condescending, um, he was right, actually, in a way. I didn't want to do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I really didn't want to do layout, and it, it kind of showed me that I needed to work harder if I wanted to get out of that kind of 
low paying, people don't give a shit about you, your disposable category, right? Before this, John and I had uh, develop, started, began to develop a uh, IP, an intellectual property called Super Punchy Girl. Can I see that? I can see that. We've already announced it. Anyways, we were in the process of de developing that since Oakville. And I remember when I came ah, home fudge. that Hard day after fuck. I'd been fired, he was like, what the well, fuck? Bex will always be there for you. And that was our main character. Good. And I cried. <laughs> I cried yeah. my eyes out. I hadn't yeah. cried up until then because I think I was still in shock. But oh, man, when he said that, it just like struck me like it doesn't matter what these companies say about me or what these people, they're just people. They're just people who work at a company. Who, however they treat you, you know, they can never take away your autonomy as an artist, your brand, your ideas. Those belong to you no matter what. Okay, remember that. That's important. If you're young and you're developing your own thing, keep it. Don't let that die. That's very, very important. Okay, I'm gonna get back to that. Anyway, so I took some time off. Um, John was like supporting me again. I had a little bit of savings, but for the most part, he was like, I was on his back for a long time. I still owe him, honestly. I wouldn't be where I am today without him. Um, he was the one, after a few months, who suggested that I try for this new layout position at Titmouse. Now, he had since left Titmouse um, for Skybound, and he still had connections at Titmouse. So he found out they were hiring for layout, and he was like, hey, why don't you just apply to this job? And, you know, I was still kind of like, I don't know, I don't want to go back to layout, I don't want to repeat the whole thing again. And he was like, trust me, it's not going to be the same. They're really, really good over there. Just give it a try, right? And I was like, I do need to, like, you know, start earning some income. Because I was still running PT Shop at the time, but I wasn't, like, doing that spectacularly. You know, like I said, all my money was going towards my bills, so Yay. I'm like, okay, Woo. I'll apply. And I got the job. I got the job. And it was awesome. <laughs> I am really glad that I did not leave the industry at that point after being fired. But at Titmouse, I kind of like found my footing again. I'm really grateful to Titmouse for allowing me to grow. Um, they gave me a raise. Um, so I wasn't like dirt poor again. And people were really nice. The project was fun. It was really fun. Actually, it's out on Netflix. My first project that I worked on on Titmouse was Archibald. Wow, yeah, it Archibald. was just so Yay. much fun. I got to draw again. Um, it was really easy and fun style. Like people, yeah, people were really laid back. My lead was super laid back. He was like the complete opposite of my last lead. Honestly, he was like, oh. Oh yeah, that's fine, don't worry about it. Like, he literally did not care, and like, he just wanted to go rock climbing or something. Like, he was really cool. So, you know, I was like ultra paranoid. Like, I had learned that from my last gig. So I was like double, triple checking, making sure I never made any mistakes. But honestly, like, yeah, I, I kind of overdid it because, well, of my experience, but... He was super chill, and then the next project I got moved on to, I'm just so excited, guys. It was Star Trek Lower Decks. I'm wearing the shirt right now. Um, my crew shirt. I was so happy to be on that show because I'm a huge Trekkie, huge nerd, and yeah, it was like, finally, you know, we had really talented people on my, t on my team, and I was like, I was, I felt so good that I, I could work next to them and call myself a part of their team. I was really proud. And it was a good way to end my relationship with the animation industry. <laughs> Actually, during that time, while I was at Titmouse, we signed a contract with um, Skybound to get our IP made into a comic book, which was insane. I, I still can't believe we did that to this day. <sighs> we worked really hard on it, but... 
yeah, it paid off in the end. So if you have a personal project, don't give up on it. It's worth it. I left Hypnos with a good conscience. Um, and then, actually, I left towards the end. That was when the pandemic hit. So, yeah. So we all started working from home, and I finished the rest of my contract from home. After that, I launched a Kickstarter for uh, something called an ETA jacket, which is a jacket um, with a clear pocket in the back that allows you to decorate it without having to worry about things falling off and you losing them. Anyways, so it was something that I came up with on my Christmas break and I had been de developing for a few months, getting samples made and working with a manufacturer and stuff like that and preparing the campaign and art, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so it launched summer of 2020 and <laughs> it blew up. <laughs> it did way better than I was anticipating, which was both extremely exciting and extremely terrifying. <laughs> you might think, you know, oh, 100K. Okay, it ended up being 180K. Oh, 180K, like, all your problems are solved. Well, no, because I was not expecting that, and my stuff was not priced to handle that volume. Um, I did not think about shipping that amount of stuff by myself, uh, so I had to hire a warehouse. And I did not think about customs <coughs> when you're importing large quantities like that. Anyways, there was a lot of things that I had not considered, including taxes. Taxes was another thing. Um, but... On the bright side, it made me realize I did not want to go back to animation. So it allowed me to leave my previously desperate state of constantly worrying about whether a studio would hire me, if I was good enough, blah, blah, blah. And it allowed me to now fully rely on my store, Peachy Shop, to um, survive on which was my goal for a very, very long time. I just didn't expect it to happen like that. So it happened, and I'm glad that it did. I encourage you to examine why you are taking the degree that you are, pursuing the career path that you are. If it's in art, why? Is it just to prove that you are good enough, that your art is good enough, that you can do it despite people telling you no, because that was kind of my reason. Um, and when I got what I wanted, I realized that it wasn't what I wanted. So I think the pandemic made people reevaluate a lot of things, and this was mine. Um, yeah, I realized that I actually didn't want to work in the animation industry after I figured out what it, what it was exactly. You know, even though I was in layout for most of it, even doing character design didn't really appeal to me. I did actually some freelance work for character design. I was like, eh, eh. <laughs> I wanted to go out on my own. I, I had a feeling that like I could make things that the general public would like. And I wanted to create those things and, and get direct feedback. Because, you know, when you work on a show, you're just a name in the credits and people don't necessarily know you. And you have to follow a style of the show that isn't yours. So you're kind of faceless as an artistic brand. And I realized that, you know, my whole journey at Sheridan was just like, I didn't like the idea of giving up. <laughs> I still don't. Um, but it kind of blinded me to the fact that it wasn't what I really wanted. The fact that I had to get, like, I had to apply three times, right? It just kind of like further told me that, you know, you just have to work harder. Not, do you really want this? <laughs> I didn't like people telling me, do you really want this? Like, no, what are you talking about? Yes, I do want it. <laughs> so I was very stubborn and it took me a long time to realize that I was just doing it to prove that I could, not because I actually <laughs> wanted it. So that was a learning experience, but you know, I, if I had to go back and do it again, I would do it the same way. I learned so much. Um, but I think <laughs> I think people should still reevaluate why you're doing the things that you're doing. Um,
during the pandemic, uh, after my Kickstarter, and I realized I didn't have to work for a while, I, I also realized I didn't want to sit at home and just work on my shop all day. And I thought, what, what would I be doing if I didn't have to work at a studio to pay my bills? And you know what? Acting. Acting was something I had wanted to do since I was in high school. I went to acting classes in Montreal. I had always been involved in theater. Didn't always get cast, but I still wanted to be involved. And so I was like, I'm gonna do acting. I, I went to classes online during the pandemic, so you know, I could just learn from the comfort of my home. I took in as much as I could. I wrote my own monologue. I performed it on self-tape. I submitted it to a bunch of agencies and I got an agent. He's a great guy. I love him bits. Um, he, he has done so much for me. He really believes in me. Um, and to this date, I've booked about three jobs and I started in like September, 2020. It's kind of related to animation in the way that it's still storytelling, but this time you get to be a part of the story, you get to be in it, you get to be a character, and I think that's so much fun. It's like character design, but with your body and your face. I think that's so much fun. I just love being involved. I love film. Obviously, it's still kind of related to animation. And last but not least, John has been doing super, super well. He got hired at Nickelodeon and then he got hired at Blizzard, and now he is about to um, start working full-time for Riot Games, which was one of my dream jobs, which is no longer anymore, but that's still cool. I get to live vicariously through him. And we are moving to LA next year, um, January, in like six months. I still can't believe that this, this all this happened in three years, but I want to share this journey with you, and I really want to i've talked with john so he'll be doing some videos with me too so yeah if you have any questions burning questions that you want to ask me or john you know either about selling your work online or working in a studio we'd be happy to make another video. promise go it's a touring can say really happy um anything we can do to help promise you really. on um, so yeah just leave us a comment and subscribe if you want to see more of these type of videos happy to make them thanks so much Okay, another one. Woo! Testa Mobile significantly reduces the testing burden on mobile development teams by making it easy to create low-code tests with auto-improving features so you can build your test once and know they'll work release after release. The result? Reduced... Hello, our friends. I'm Alicia Said, your resident illustrator extraordinaire, and today we are going to be talking about dreams. Specifically, talking about the concept of dream jobs, the pressure to succeed, and the fear of failure. Something a little different, something a little cheesier, whatever, definitely not my usual content, but I had wanted to make this video for quite a while now, and I just kept putting it off. But a couple of days ago, I realized that this is the perfect time to talk about this. Not only because we are in the beginning of the new year, the start of 2022, but also because recently it was the anniversary of this Twitter post that I made that kind of went viral. I made this post on December 31st, 2018, three whole years ago, and it basically talks about why I decided to quit my dreams of working in animation. For those of you who don't know, currently I work as an award-winning children's book writer and illustrator, but for most of my life, since I was like 15, my absolute biggest dream in the world was to work in animation, specifically working as a character designer or visual development artist at a big fancy studio like Disney or Pixar. I wanted this more than anything else in the world, and I worked so, so hard to try to get there, but unfortunately, it just didn't work out, and I got rejection after rejection after rejection. However, uh, this video is not going to be a sad story because my decision to change my career path and go into children's illustration was the best thing that I ever did and every day I wake up grateful that I made that choice. Although working in animation was a huge dream of mine for 10 years, it ultimately just wasn't right for me. But out of pure spite and fear of failure, I was trying to cling on to it even though it wasn't great for my career or my mental health. And making that hard decision to let that dream go ultimately was the metamorphosis I needed that made me go from an anxious little caterpillar 
into the super happy butterfly that I am today. Ever since I made that Twitter post about my journey, I've actually had a lot of people uh, come up to me telling me that it really resonated with them and that it either um, helped them come to terms with their own career change or it gave them the boost to do it. So, because this is a new year and we're all making resolutions right now, um, I know that sometimes you can end up feeling a lot of pressure to fulfill and achieve your goals. Or, you know, if you're looking back at the resolutions that you made last year and you weren't able to take some of those goals off, you might be feeling a little bit hard on yourself. But I'm hoping that after sharing my personal journey with reduction and evolution, you might look into your goals in a healthier way. So yeah, in today's video, I just wanted to share my um, artistic journey and career from like high school way back in like 2010 until now as a 28 year old. I want to talk about my struggles working on animation. information on my career path, uh, starting from like high school, art school, etc. And then I want to talk about my series of failures, and why I made the switch, and then some advice on what to do if you're also confused about your goals. This is going to be a pretty long video, so I included all of the timestamps below. And as always, you know, this is a video made with lots of love and care. And if you like what I do, please consider giving it a like and a follow. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's go. well into my teens when it really wasn't cool to do so. I remember this very distinct moment in 10th grade when I believe I got a comment on one of my fan arts on DeviantArt and someone was like, wow, this looks great. You should work in animation. And that's when it kind of clicked for me that, oh, right, this is a paying job that a, a, someone could have, that there is an adult out there who actually works and also around that time was when we started to see an animation and kind of both out of the video. We got to see it with the video of the story three and how to do the job. So for me, I thought I would be able to lantern scene filled me with so much love for the medium and just like mm. what it was capable of um, and then a few months later I found the book The Art of Tangled in a bookstore and I was like oh hmm, what's this this looks interesting and again I was blown away seeing all of the behind the scenes artwork the concept art all of the details and the research that the design team did to um, recreate the old that Disney movie aesthetic but and again, I realized that this is to be a part being a character designer, being a visual development artist. And from then on, I was set. Mm. This was my dream. I wanted to work at Disney and help make meaningful movies like these um, that could inspire people. And I was ready to do whatever it took to get there. When I graduated in 2011, I really wanted to attend a big fancy school in America for animation. I really wanted to apply to Cal Arts or Texas, but I was really not going to be too far away from home. Anyway, I only passed it there 
for one semester and I was so miserable, I came back home feeling super dejected and I ended up spending the rest of the year back at home. Shortly after, my family moved to Switzerland because of my dad's job and I ended up moving with them because what else was I going to do? There, I enrolled in Cerulean Ecole.Visuel since it was the only school in the area with an animation program. Unfortunately, the art school was taught entirely in French and when I did learn French, I more sure that I why that I wanted to be a visual development artist not an animator and I felt that maybe my illustration classes would be better suited to build my design portfolio rather than the animation program which was really all um, actual like 2d animating and no design classes so for three years I worked my butt off in the illustration program and when I got home from school I focused all of my time on studying books and artists and working on my animation portfolio. During my school years, I would try to apply to art and animation internships. For example, both DreamWorks and Disney have a yearly summer internship program. experience. I would see other artists age going to schools like CalArts and Gobelons and having access to all of these resources and professors and networking opportunities and job fairs and creating these gorgeous short films. And so even at 19, I already felt like I was falling behind. And obviously, going to these schools doesn't get me J.P. Miller and M. Sasek. And it really ended up influencing my art style, and I started to create more illustration pieces that were geared towards children's books. applying and applying to internships and getting rejections and you know I'm getting closer to graduation and so I also start to apply to full-time positions as well 
for context, uh, this is the portfolio that I submitted that I worked on in my personal time. This was an original concept I did visual development for, including examples of design. rejected by every single one of them except for one and I ended up joining them. Anyway, yes, I had an illustration agent. You can kind of see that it sort of just happened. Um, I wasn't really focused on making illustration my career, but within two months of joining this agency, mm. I actually mm. started to get a couple of jobs mm. to them and I started to work on some books because why not? So in May of 2015, as a concept artist on the preschool show Dot, and it was a pretty fun experience. It was a really great first job. And so for a year, um, I would work nine to five working at my job in animation, and then after a horrible 90 minute commute, come home and then work on my to distract me away from my dreams of animation. And so after a little break and reworking my design portfolio, I began to apply to studios again. For the next two years, this just became an endless cycle of me applying to animation studios whenever a new position came up, reworking my portfolio and repeat. I applied for visual development, color design, character design, prop design, background paint, literally anything within like the art area of animation. Um, you can see my little folder here where I have all of my old resumes and CVs and a big hoard, all rejected. Um, I don't even know how many positions I applied for in the end. Um, and it was either like an endless stream of rejections or total silence, which was even worse since you were just waiting for nothing. Um, mm. And of course, the rejection was super, super frustrating. I was putting in all of this work and I thought that I was told you you were to I thought I had a portfolio. I attended a few events like CP9 in LA every year. I worked as an art staff, a lawyer, an industry professional. I attended a few events with other involve myself within the animation community um, and I ended up making a lot of friends. I connected with recruiters and art directors and was having regular conversation with them. Basically, I had all of the networking parts covered. However, although I thought I was doing everything right, the main issue was my portfolio, the most important component. Um, I just didn't realize it then. First of all, like I said, I was applying to all of these, um, you know, prop design, color design. Um, like for example, if I was submitting to prop design, I would still use my general biz dev portfolio that I submitted for everything. You should always adjust your portfolio for the position. Like in this case, I should have submitted a prop mm. portfolio. Secondly, mm. while it does have some decent pieces in my portfolio, for the most part, it wasn't a functional design portfolio. Uh, drawing super painterly elaborate characters. 
graphic designs is fun and all, but it could never be animated with TV budgets, so it's essentially useless. You need pieces that give a lot of information, which means a lot of things like turnarounds and model sheets, expression sheets, orthographics, dynamic poses, showing your characters in every angle and just making it clear. insecure of my work and an absolute failure that I didn't get a single yes in two years. And although I was blaming myself, I also fell into the trap of blaming everything around me. Some of these traps include, I'm an international artist and studios don't want to put in the effort of hiring me. That's why I'm not getting hired. Which is kind of true and it's a lot harder for international artists to get visas or work. But it is still possible to get hired as an international artist so that couldn't be the reason. Oh, schools like the colors have a direct type on your studios. That's why you can hire a lot of true that some schools have better resources I already mentioned. That people from all different schools or even self-taught get hired all the time. This industry is all about connections and who you know. Sure, studios will make a job posting public, but we all know it's just for show. They'll just hire from within, or artists will get jobs through their friends. And yes, while networking is a big part of the industry, again, it's not the whole story. And I'm just kidding. I'll be the first to admit that a little bit of spite and jealousy really inspires me to work hard. Um, however, I fell into a horrible jealousy pit. It was the kind of envy that just like ate up my soul. It was so bad. Because here I was getting rejected in the after and then I see everyone around me getting a It was like Every other week on Twitter, one of my friends would announce that they just got a job working at a cool studio. And it was horrible because they were my friends and I was so proud of them for their achievement and I was trying so, so hard to be happy for them. But I couldn't help but feel a little mad at their success and wondering, why not me? Um, why do you get to be happy and not me? And it didn't help that I was getting older and I felt like time was running out. Um, unfortunately, that was the of racism in the industry of white people. Very successful and young as possible. I don't really know where this came from. I think it's partly because social media really loves to highlight the wonderkins and the prodigies. Um, it's partly because big corporations love hiring newbies fresh out of school so they can be easily exploited. And also because digital art has become a lot more accessible now, so kids are able to start drawing earlier. So you have a lot of really talented kids. And so yeah, every year we see a new crop of artists. Fresh new talent every year. I feel and then all of my friends who are in the industry working at their dream jobs would ask me how my job search is going. And they'd say that they can't believe I haven't been hired yet and that it's only a matter of time until I get picked up by a great studio. And they were being kind, but it always hurt a little bit. And yeah, I absolutely hated that feeling of jealousy. And people talked about this more and felt alone in feeling this, like I was a monster for having these emotions that no one else was having. Um, as a side note, I'm thinking of making another video talking about bad artist feelings and talking about insecurity and jealousy and all of that and just how to tackle it. I think it's a topic that should be about community, so if you're interested, um, I'd like to hear about it, please let me know. Um, yeah, that's all I have for this video. But eventually, I was able to control my envy by reframing my perspective. First thing to 